Speak right into the microphone. How about this? I'm going to try not to move. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, my name is Jonathan Jackson. I am a researcher uh, affiliated with the Massachusetts Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, the MADRC. Uh, we have the purple table that's right behind all of you. Uh, Ms. Lenore Jackson-Pope is uh, sitting right there. If you want to find out more about the MADRC and the wonderful research and opportunities uh, that we have for you there. So please stop by and say hi to Lenore and tell her I sent you. Um, so today I'm going to be sp uh, speaking with you all about uh, the brain, aging, and memory loss. So we're going to talk about Alzheimer's disease. We're going to talk a little bit about dementia. We're going to try to figure out what the heck is going on uh, when it comes to Alzheimer's disease and dementia. We're going to talk about uh, some of the latest research that's going on, stuff that um, has come out in the past few days or weeks. Um, some of the stuff uh, is, is maybe as old as a year, but all of it is really, really recent, relevant information that you might have heard a little bit about in the news, but I'm here to give you kind of the, the inside story on everything. All right, so uh, with, that, with that said, we're going to go ahead and uh, get going. And there, if we want to have time for questions at the end, I'm going to have to kind of push through uh, a lot of stuff relatively quickly. But don't worry if I lose you at any point. Just kind of politely check out and then kind of check back in in about five or six minutes and we'll go from there. All right? Um, so before we begin, uh, I want to say that I have a, a what's called a disclosure of conflicts of interest uh, slide on here. And so this might seem really boring and uninteresting, but if anybody is trying to tell you anything uh, about any kind of information, you should know who's, who's signing their checks. Uh, because sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the only place that's, that's signing my checks at the moment is Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, they do not sign large enough checks for me to lie. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about does not really have much to do with, with MGH as an institution anyway. So, uh, But this is a statement to always look for when anybody's trying to tell you any kind of information. So I'm a scientist. I'm paid by a science-seeking, um, science science-making institution. And that's it. I'm not paid by pharmaceutical companies or anybody else. Um, we have, yes, okay, a little bit louder still, okay, all right, I'm going to speak right into the, the microphone if I can, all right, um, so we have four goals for today's talk, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about how memories work and where they're stored in the brain, we're going to talk a little bit about what goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease, We'll talk about the latest research, and I do mean the very latest research in Alzheimer's disease, and then we're gonna wrap up with how to age gracefully. So I'm gonna give you a few tips and tricks uh, from the field, from the, the perspective of science, on how to, uh, to, to get old in, in, uh, in, in as graceful a fashion as possible. So the first thing that I wanna talk to you about is how memory works and where memory is stored in the brain. Uh, so when we talk about memory, I think most of us think of something that looks a little bit like this. So we think of a, a video camera or a, maybe if you're fancy, a DVR player inside your head. And uh, whenever I ask you what you were doing last Friday night, you sort of hit rewind. Maybe there's a rewind button behind your ear. Uh, you rewind back to Friday night at 7 p.m. and you kind of see that you're having dinner with your family. Uh, if there's one thing that we've learned in about 125 years of, of memory research is that this is wrong. This is not at all how memory works. Uh, memory is not a video camera inside your head, and it's not any kind of uh, what we call a veridical player. So it's not always true, and it's not always accurate. Um, a better way to think about memory is not in the sense of a video camera inside your head, but instead, I would encourage all of you to think about Lego. So does everybody know what Lego is, like the Lego bricks? So I, I have a five and a half year old at home, so I'm used to stepping on Legos in the morning when I've told her to clean them up the night before. So that's my experience with Legos. But you can actually think of Legos in a very different way, which is uh, as an opportunity to try to uh, think about how memory works. And this hopefully will help you uh, be more appreciative that your memory works at all. So I know that many of us get frustrated with our, with our senior moments. Uh, you know, I'm starting to have a few myself, and we, we want our memories just to work all the time. But the fact of the matter is that our memory looks a little bit more like this. It's, it's composed of pieces. You have a kind of the core part of the memory, which is called an ingram. Uh, and then in addition to that ingram of the memory, we also add little Lego pieces for the context, the time of day, our emotions, how hungry we were, 
uh, what the weather was like outside, any kind of detail that you can uh, that you can call to mind is a different Lego piece. And together you put them all together to, to kind of create what's, what I guess I'll call a Lego memory. So if you're missing a few Lego pieces, sometimes you can still put that Lego memory together. Uh, sometimes if you're missing a, like a couple of key pieces, like the core part of that memory, you can't remember anything else at all. So uh, when you have those senior moments, or if you have, uh, have, have how many of you have had uh, that, that tip of the tongue phenomenon? Yes. All right, so still closer, huh? No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so how many of you have had, oh, we got a little bit of feedback here. Okay. How's that? Okay, I, I, that's good for me. Can everybody still hear me at this volume? All right, great. So how many of you are familiar with the, the tip of the tongue phenomenon? So you've seen a movie and then there's that actor and you know that her name begins with like an R and it's like two syllables and it kind of sounds like da 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 and you can't quite put it together. So if you think about memory as an assembly of Lego pieces, that phenomenon makes a lot more sense. You've got some of the Lego pieces, but you don't have the rest of them. You don't have enough to remember that name. And that's why it's easy to recognize the name, but you can't come up with it on your own. So instead of thinking about memory like a video camera or like a DVR player, it's much easier and better to think about it as an assembly of Lego pieces. So that's important and sets an important context for the rest of today's talk. So if you remember one thing, it's that memory is like Lego. So I'm gonna do a little bit of neuroanatomy over these next couple of slides, so don't worry. I promise this will be easy. I promise we'll make this as accessible and easy for everybody as possible. So this is a picture of a human brain. So hopefully we, we we're all on the same part, same page about that, right? Okay, it's actually a picture of a brain looking this way. All right, so the eyes would be over here, kind of between uh, the blue and the green part. The back of the head is over here in the red part. And uh, I, I'm, I'm what's known, or what was recently known as a, a cognitive neuroscientist. So if you've got all the different kinds of neuroscientists and line them up in, in like a, in for like a softball league, the cognitive neuroscientists would be picked last. Um, so we are the ones who are always forgotten because we have to sort of explore the deepest questions with the most crude materials. So I say all that because uh, I only care about the big colorful bits of the brain. I don't really care about these parts of the brain here, the cerebellum and the brainstem. So they control really unimportant things like breathing and blinking and your you know, heart rate and all that stuff. So we don't care about any of that today. We just care about the parts of your brain that you do thinking bits with. Uh, and so a quick tour of the, of the brain that I care about um, is that there are four big lobes, four big lobes of the brain. Who's heard of the different lobes of the brain before? Okay, so some of you have, so this will be a good refresher. All right, so the big blue part in the front is called the frontal lobe because as cognitive neuroscientists, we are all very creative with our naming. So the frontal lobe is at the front of your brain and that controls a lot of the parts of, the, uh, of your brain that, uh, that you really think about. So if you have to be uh, concentrating on something like hopefully you're doing now, each and every one of you, uh, you'll be engaging your frontal lobes to pay attention. Uh, you also use it for, for basic reasoning if you have to kind of work through a puzzle or something logical or a problem. Uh, you can also use uh, your frontal lobes for, for part of your personality. Uh, so what makes you you is largely contained here in the frontal lobes of the brain. So additionally, we've got the parietal lobe, which is kind of up and towards the back of the head a little bit right here. And the parietal lobe is, uh, is responsible for kind of putting a lot of the other signals uh, of the brain together. So it's responsible for what we call sensory integration. Uh, because you're sitting here and it probably feels like you are one person experiencing one thing. But the reality is that you're taking in signals from your eyes, from your ears, uh, from all over your body, like the, the feeling of your clothes, uh, which you probably weren't paying attention to until I mentioned it. Uh, you know, the feeling of your left foot in your left shoe, that kind of stuff. All of that kind of combines together uh, and creates, and it comes to like a more cohesive experience here in the parietal lobe. The back of the lobe here, the occipital lobe, it looks like it's small, but it's fully one quarter of this part of our brain, of our cortex. And that's uh, the occipital lobe, and it's responsible for a lot of our vision. So even though it's in the back of your head here, it does take in a lot of the signals that you get in from your eyes. Um, and then finally, we have this big green sp uh, splodge here is called the temporal lobe. Now, because it's next to your ears, you might, have, you might have a feeling that it has something to do with hearing, and it does. It is home to what we call the auditory cortex, 
but it is also home to three small, humble brain regions that will comprise uh, kind of the, the rest of our talk. Okay, so if you're, for those of you who are taking notes, for those of you who are listening very carefully, there are three brain regions that you need to know about because this is the epicenter of, the, the, of our understanding of Alzheimer's disease. So it is the hippocampus. Who's heard of the hippocampus before? Okay, great. All right, and then there's the parahippocampal formation. Who's heard of that one? Okay, far fewer hands. But because the hippocampus is next to the parahippocampal formation, yeah, they, they kind of work together. And then the third part is called the entorhinal cortex. Who's heard of that one before? Okay, a couple of hands, great job, all right. So those are the three brain regions, the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the entorhinal cortex. Together, these three brain regions comprise something that we call the medial temporal lobe, the MTL. And the medial temporal lobe, so for those of you who are still with me, the medial temporal lobe is where our memories are reassembled. So all of those Lego pieces come together in just the right way at just the right time in the medial temporal lobe. So those three brain regions, the intermedial cortex, the parahippocampal formation, and the, and the hippocampus itself, they all have slightly different roles in putting those memories together. But that's where memories are reassembled. So why do we have memory problems as we get older? Okay, so now let's talk. Now that we've gone over the basic neuroanatomy stuff, now you're all neuroscientists because you're all in this with me. Um, let's go one step further into some very complicated data. And I promise this is the most complicated slide I'm gonna show you today. So if you can follow this, you're gonna be just fine for the rest of the talk. If you don't follow it, it's, it really doesn't matter. You're gonna be okay, I promise. All right, so what we've got here are three different regions of the brain. So one of them is the hippocampus, one of them is primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe, the back of your head that you use for vision, and the other one is uh, the, the lateral prefrontal cortex, which is part of the frontal lobe, okay? So we've got a lot of dots here, and what these dots represent are changes, or, or I should say more specifically differences in brain size and region size over time. Okay, so as we go from left to, li left to right, we're getting younger to older. So age 20 to age 90, as you go left to right. As you go top to bottom, you're getting smaller. So large brain size, small brain size. All right, we've got three different lines here. Okay, so is everyone with me so far? So you've got three black lines. So this first black line is corresponds to the lateral prefrontal cortex. For those of you who are working really hard at this talk and trying to listen, this is the part of your brain that you're engaging right now, the lateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, and as we see is that as people get older, that line moves down at a steady rate. So it's biggest when you're 20, sorry for virtually everyone in the room, and it just gets sort of smaller over time. So it's biggest when you're a kid, uh, or I guess a, a, a very young adult, excuse me, uh, and then it gets much smaller um, at a pretty steady rate after that. So we have a very steady decline over time. So big when you're 20, small when you're 90. Lateral prefrontal cortex. However, the brain does not change uniformly with age. Some parts change at a relatively steady rate in time, but now let's look over here to the primary visual cortex. This is the part of your brain that you use to see in the back of your head. You can see this line is much shallower over the same amount of time. So between the ages of 20 and the age of 90, that part of the brain doesn't change much at all. And some people think that it doesn't change at all. So the primary visual cortex stays about the same size over the whole course of your life. The third image is the hippocampus. And that name should sound familiar because the hippocampus forms the biggest part of the medial temporal lobe. So remember we talked about the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the entorhinal cortex. So going back to that hippocampus, we see that this line is bendy. It's a line that's curvy. So we, as scientists, call it a curvilinear function because it just means that the line is curvy. That's, that's really it. Um, and so what does a curvy line mean here? Okay, so what it means is that from ages 20 to your early 40s, it stays about the same size. And then <laughs> when you move into your 40s and 50s, that line gets steeper and steeper and steeper in terms of its decline. 
So um, the change that you see from 40 to 50 is smaller than the change that you see from 50 to 60, which is smaller than the change that you see from 60 to 70. So basically, this is why you have memory problems as you get older. This is where those senior, mem mem those senior moments come from. There is one part of your brain that is extremely sensitive to the aging process, and that is your hippocampus. And that is why, that's why you associate memory problems with getting older. And this is just healthy aging. We're not talking about Alzheimer's disease. We're not talking about dementia. This is just a, the normal aging process. The hippocampus is very sensitive to age-related decline, so that means you have memory problems. That's, that means you have those senior moments. I'm sorry, that's just the, that's the bad news. All right, uh, so what we see here, the brain does not change uniformly with age. Some parts change at a steady rate, some parts change hardly at all, some parts change but only when you get older. So now that we've talked about healthy aging, normal aging, we've talked about the brain and I've turned you all into neuroscientists, let's uh, explore uh, what happens with Alzheimer's disease, okay? All right, um, but before we do that, I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about what Alzheimer's disease does uh, to us as a society. So these are the latest facts and figures from the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. So they are the ones who kind of determine the top 10 leading causes of death every year. And what you can see is that heart disease and cancer are the top two leading causes of death by a long way. But Alzheimer's disease comes in at number six. And I wanna tell you a few things about this number, about this ranking of Alzheimer's disease in sixth. So number one is that in 1999, Alzheimer's disease was 10th on this list, and it's moved up. Between 1999 and 2014, Alzheimer's deaths, Alzheimer's related deaths, increased by 55% in the United States. And I'll tell you something else. Uh, so I've been giving this talk for a few years, and so I update this number every year. From 2014 to 2015, Alzheimer's disease increased by 11% in the United States. Every other entry on this list changed by less than 3%. I did the math myself. Alzheimer's disease in one year increased 11%. And going from 2015 to 2016, one second, and, and going from 2015 to 2016, I don't know if you saw some of these headlines late last year, but for the first time in many years, uh, the human, US life expectancy decreased by a tenth of a year. So most of the news headlines attributed this to the opioid epidemic. But if you read the CDC final report, it's attributed to the op opioid e epidemic and the increased prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. So both of those led to uh, a decrease in the US life expectancy. So we are dealing with um, uh, a public health crisis when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. And one final fact is that uh, frequently when people uh, succumb to, to Alzheimer's disease, uh, the cause of death is not always listed as Alzheimer's disease. So if you read about uh, like a celebrity in the news like Gene Wilder about a year and a half ago, uh, it doesn't say that he died of Alzheimer's disease. The phrase is always the same. They died of complications due to Alzheimer's disease. And in the vast majority of cases, that means that they have a respiratory infection or pneumonia. And depending on where you are and who uh, kind of determines the cause of death, some of those deaths are rolled into this as a cause of death. So even though Alzheimer's disease is rapidly increasing as a leading health crisis, even though it's, leading, uh, it's kind of slowly climbing up the ranks of, uh, of, of causes of death, it's still woefully undercounted as a, as a cause of death, especially in communities of color. So uh, we see that this is sixth, but if you uh, look into some communities of color, so for African Americans, for example, it may be as high as the fourth leading cause of death. And again, this is for all individuals. This is not just for people over the age of 65. When you uh, break it down for just older adults, Alzheimer's disease leaps again into the top five. So we are dealing with a, a very, very serious uh, problem in Alzheimer's disease. So what is Alzheimer's disease? All right, so you're all neuroscientists, so you're cool, right? So we're gonna take another look at a cross section of the brain, okay? This is what Alzheimer's disease is. And so I want you to know that I'm showing you this picture for a reason. I'm not showing somebody getting lost. I'm not some, showing somebody putting their keys in the microwave. I'm not showing you know, poor wandering behavior. What I'm showing you is a, a, what's called a silver stain of the brain. It's, it's called a silver stain, but it's pink. I don't really know. Um, but 
Uh, what I have here are four circles. I've got two red circles and two black circles. When I first started giving this talk, um, gosh, about 2011, uh, I had this exact slide, but I only had the red circles. What's become very, very clear in the last few years is that you need the red and the black circles together. So now, what am I talking about? I keep talking about these circles. What are they? So who here has heard of amyloid before? Amyloid A beta, AB42, A beta 42. It goes by a lot of names. There are lots of variations on what amyloid is. But frankly, amyloid is a protein that builds up in the brain. You have amyloid your whole life. It does a lot of different things in the brain. Sometimes it has something to do with uh, maintaining fats and lipid transport throughout the brain. It does a lot of things. But in Alzheimer's disease, this process goes wrong. So normally, the way that amyloid works is that it has to be stretched out and cut very precisely at a very exact length of a number of amino acids. And when that process goes wrong, it springs back on itself. So for those of you who aren't following, the example that I'd like to give is, uh, does everybody know what, what saran wrap is? Okay, everybody knows what saran wrap is. Like especially, you know, as we're starting to move into the spring and the summer, uh, you, you, if you're good at saran wrap, if you are not Jonathan Jackson, <laughs> what happens when you pull out that saran wrap? You pull it out, you stretch it out, you, you tear it, and then you put it on your potato salad and you stick it in the fridge and you're done, right? That's what normally happens. What happens when you're bad at saran wrap? So it, it's sort of, you try to, usually it happens when you try to tear it, right? When you try to tear that saran wrap, it sort of twists back and it sticks only to itself, and you end up with like this ball of plastic that's pretty useless. And if you're really cheap like me, you want to get that saran wrap back, right? <laughs> But usually, like, especially if you buy like the, like, the, like the store brand version, you can't pull it apart, right? It's just stuck. And you have to tear it off and you have to throw it away. A very similar process happens with the amyloid in the brain. It's supposed to be cut at a certain length, the cutting process goes wrong, and it tangles back on itself. Imagine this process building up in the brain for decades. And imagine you didn't have the option of throwing it away it could lead to some kind of disruptions in brain function, right? But it turns out that your brain is a very resilient organ. So you can deal with a lot of amyloid in your brain by itself. That does not necessarily lead to Alzheimer's disease. You need tau as well. So I like to mix my metaphors as thoroughly as possible. So when we talk about tau, I'm gonna talk about water damage. So you guys remember that really awful winter a few years ago where we had all those ice dams? So how many of you, or maybe someone you know, had to deal with water damage? Like, if you had water damage in your wall, right, what happens? It sort of stains. So can you just paint over the stain? What, what, what usually happens to the sheetrock? You have to take it away and you have to tear it out, right? Because it's been fully compromised. A very similar process happens with the tau protein in the brain as well. So you've got a tau, um, which is a protein that you need your whole life. It maintains the rigidity of those cell walls. So if the tau is going well, your, your, your brain cells are doing just fine. But through a process called hyperphosphorylation, it gets a, a phosphate group added to it for the nerds in the room. Um, but when that phosphate group gets added to the tau, it's like having water damage to, that, to the walls of that brain cell. And those brain cells sort of unravel and it allows the amyloid to come through, and those two processes combine together, and they kill off brain cells. So you need the amyloid and you need the tau in the same part of the brain together to trigger Alzheimer's disease. One of the things that we've learned in the past few years is that one of them is not enough. You need both. This is the process that leads to Alzheimer's disease. So what I've got here is an updated, um, it's gonna be a little movie. <clears throat> Uh, so I started showing a version of this movie uh, six years ago, and about two weeks ago, the same research team, uh, where I went to graduate school at Washington University in St. Louis, um, released an updated version. So what you see here, for those of you who can read at the bottom of the screen, it says estimated years to onset, and it's set at negative 25. So this isn't 25 years before the time of death. This is 25 years before the time of diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So we're starting a quarter century before the doctor says you've got dementia, okay? 
So, spoiler alert, it looks like there are changes in the brain many years before you're told that you have Alzheimer's disease. So, what I would like you to really pay attention to are the bottom slides here. So, what we've got are uh, two slices of the brain. Um, so, this, the bottom left is looking this way, the bottom right is looking this way. Uh, this, this picture is the outside of the brain, this picture is the inside of the brain, okay? And as these colors warm up from purple and blue, that represents more and more of this amyloid in the brain, okay? And so just so you know, as soon as we get to kind of the light blues and the greens, that's a worrying amount of amyloid. So you shouldn't have any of this, uh, of this amyloid plaque in your brain at all under normal circumstances. So that's kind of where we are at 25 years before the time of diagnosis. So now we're kind of counting up. We're at 22 years out, and we're already seeing changes on the inside of the brain. We're seeing a buildup of amyloid. 14, 15 years out, we've already got a worrying amount of amyloid in certain parts of the brain. So that uh, builds up in a part of the brain called uh, the parietal lobe, which I talked about before, but it also builds up in another part of the brain called the medial temporal lobe, which is comprised of the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the entorhinal cortex. So now we're about 10 years after the time of diagnosis, and you can see that we've maxed out the ability uh, to, to measure any more amyloid in certain parts of the brain, particularly in that medial temporal lobe. So what we see here uh, especially in these bottom slides, in the bottom half of these slides, is that uh, amyloid builds up at least 15, maybe as much as 20 years before someone is diagnosed with the disease. So imagine having untreated hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes for two decades before thinking, maybe I should go to the doctor. That's where we are with Alzheimer's disease right now. And that's why it has been so tricky to try to treat, to diagnose, and ultimately to cure. So you might be thinking, okay, amyloid and tau, they combine, they kill off a brain cell. I've got 80 billion brain cells in the, my cortex alone, and I've got another 80 billion in the cerebellum. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, it's probably okay if I, if I lose one or two, but if that process is going on for two or three decades, you end up with going from a brain right here on the left, which is a normal brain, to one on the right. So even though all of you guys are neuroscientists now, even, I think even for those of your friends who weren't part of this talk can appreciate the difference in these two images. You can see that the brain on the right looks like Swiss cheese. And that's because that combination of amyloid and tau has resulted in the destruction of billions of brain cells. So in the United Kingdom, over in England, um, they used to have a campaign, uh, their Alzheimer's Society had a campaign called Share the Orange. And that's because the brain, which is normally about three pounds, loses the weight of an orange over the course of Alzheimer's disease. That's a lot of brain cells. Tens of billions of brain cells are lost due to the combination of amyloid and tau. So um, when it comes to why Alzheimer's disease affects memory in particular, Alzheimer's actually felt, uh, affects a lot of behaviors, uh, but we think of it as a problem of memory, and that's because, uh, as we saw from those slides earlier, Alzheimer's disease tends to start in the interrhinal cortex. It moves to the parahippocampal formation, and it really starts to take off in the hippocampus. The same parts of the brain that are very sensitive to age-related decline are incredibly sensitive to the Alzheimer's disease process. This is why when you sometimes go to your, your, your primary care doctor and you say, doc, I'm having memory problems, she might respond, well, that could be normal aging or that could be dementia, I don't know. It's because both of those processes start in the same part of the brain. But Alzheimer's disease has the problem of amyloid and tau. Normal aging does not. That's the big difference between the two, okay? So let's talk about, let's get, we're gonna play like a kind of a quick round of is it dementia? Um, so I've got two columns here, normal AD, or sorry, excuse me, normal aging or possible Alzheimer's disease dementia. So if you look at these two, we can kind of compare. Bad decisions every once in a while, 
Maybe you go to Foxwoods, maybe you have a bad night. Doesn't mean that you have Alzheimer's disease. But if you have a routinely poor judgment and decision making, let's say that you were an accountant, but you are having difficulty doing, you know, maybe your, your granddaughter's taxes. Um, you know, that could be potentially be a problem. You know, maybe you were uh, a scientist, but you're having trouble uh, doing something basic like, you know, putting water in your, 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 your Brita filter, for example. So something, you know, if you're, if you're having routinely uh, difficult, uh, difficulty in doing things that you're used to doing all the time, then that could potentially be problematic. Um, if you miss a bill once a month, maybe uh, your national grid bill comes in and you, and you miss it for the month of March. Um, does it mean that you have, does it mean you need to, you know, turn to your, your husband and say, oh Lord, it's starting, you know, finally it's coming for me. It's, it's really okay, it's really okay. Uh, but if you can't manage a budget, especially if that's something that you used to do, that's, a, that's much more of a problem. If you forget what day it is, but you remember later, you're fine, you're fine. Okay, I want you to just look into my eyes and, and feel this with me. You're fine. But if you lose track of the season or the year, that's a little bit more of a trouble. I know we just moved from winter to spring. That's not what I'm talking about. That's what, like, if I asked you what season it was now and you said, I don't know, it's fall. And then if I asked you what month it was, you said, I don't know, it's probably January. You know, the fact that those things don't match up is, is much more indicative of a problem. Uh, sometimes if you forget the, um, the, yeah, the, um, <laughs> if you, um, if you can't remember the right word in a conversation, Okay, we're all gonna say this together. You're fine. You're okay. Just breathe. But if you have difficulty holding an entire conversation, especially if it's somebody that you know, somebody that you're familiar with, um, that could potentially be more indicative of a problem. A word every now and then, not a big deal. Finally, if you, uh, if you, can, if you misplace your items, you can't remember where you put your keys, uh, but you're able to retrace your steps and you're able to find them, you're fine. Also, if you can't remember where you put your keys and that's been a problem for 60 years, then you're fine. <laughs> Usually when, we, when we're talking about changes that may be indicative of dementia, it has to be a change from your baseline. So if you've always been bad with names and faces, like I am, then you're still fine if you're, if you're having trouble with that when you're 85 or 90. Um, if you were maybe a, a formal elementary school teacher and you're normally used to remembering hundreds of names and suddenly you can't keep track of one or two, that may be a problem. So you're looking for changes relative to whatever your baseline is. And that's when you should maybe talk to your doctor uh, about having a, a basic dementia screen or a wellness check. <clears throat> so finally, I wanted to talk about the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. I've been throwing them around a little bit willy-nilly in this conversation, and I'm sure some of you are wondering, you know, I, I think my grandma had Alzheimer's disease, but she might have had dementia. That's, that's a comment that I get a lot. So it turns out that there's a difference. When it comes to Alzheimer's disease, we need to think about the problem of plaques and tangles building up in the brain. We need to build, we need to think about the transition from the brain on the left to the brain on the right. We don't need to talk about behavior or thinking or memory. All of that is under dementia. So dementia is sort of like an umbrella term. It just means that there's a problem with your memory and thinking abilities. You can have dementia because of Alzheimer's disease, but you can have dementia for a lot of other reasons. You can have dementia because of uh, vascular changes in your brain. You can have dementia that's potentially due to a stroke. You can have dementia due to depression or alcoholism. Some of, these times, some of these kinds of dementia are reversible. Normal pressure hydrocephalus can cause dementia, but you cure the normal pressure hydrocephalus, you cure the dementia. So dementia is sort of like this umbrella term. It's like saying that you have a headache. There are a lot of reasons you can have a headache. Some of them are serious, some of them are not. The same is true for dementia, okay? So Alzheimer's disease is one kind of dementia. It's the most common kind of dementia for adults over the age of 65, but it is not the only kind of dementia. Okay, does that make sense? All right, great. 
So now let's talk a little bit about the latest in Alzheimer's research. And this is a part of the talk that I always get the most excited about because I, it's never the same talk twice. So I'm gonna be giving talks up and down the North Shore over the next six weeks. If you come and watch me give this talk six times, this section will be different six times. And I'm giving these talks in like the next two months. So that's the speed that we're talking about of innovation for, the Alzheimer's, for Alzheimer's disease. I'm actually gonna go home tonight and change this section again because there's new stuff that's happened uh, just over the weekend. So, um, a quick word on genetics. Oh, okay. When it comes to genetics and Alzheimer's disease, everybody says, my grandmother's cousin's stepdaughter got it, so that means I'm gonna get it too, right? Usually not. When it comes to genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease, the largest genetic risk comes from an immediate family member. Alzheimer's disease does not skip a generation. So if you're worried about somebody in your immediate family, your parents, your siblings, your children, that's really where the, a lot of the genetic risk comes from. Don't worry about your auntie, don't worry about your grandparents. It's really immediate family history, okay? There are some exceptions to that rule, but generally, if you see it in your immediate family, that's really where you might have cause to worry. But in the, again, in the vast majority of cases, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Most, most of the time, Alzheimer's disease is what we call sporadic, which means it just sort of pops up out of nowhere. So you could be the only person in your family with it. Um, everybody else in your family could have it, but you, but you may not, okay? So another way of thinking about genetics, and I think this is very recent given uh, some of the new headlines over the past week, is to think about the weather, okay? So this is an audience participation portion, so get your prefrontal cortex fired up and ready. Okay, so if I say I am Jonathan Jackson, not researcher at Mass General Hospital, but if I say I'm Jonathan Jackson, meteorologist, accredited by the American Weather Service, and I say that there is a 10% chance of snow this afternoon, how many of you are gonna cancel your plans? No one, no one's gonna, okay, is this because of last week's missed four Easter, right? That's what this is, right? okay. If I say, I am Channel 5 weatherman Jonathan Jackson, accredited by the American Meteorological Society, and I say that there is an 80% chance of significant snowfall this afternoon, how many of you are gonna start changing your plans? Okay. All right, so here's a tricky bit. If I say, I am accredited weatherman Jonathan Jackson, who is, you know, occasionally handsome, uh, and I say that there is a 35% chance of snow, who's gonna change their plans? Okay, so there's, there's one very confident woman right here in the front. God bless you. I'm glad that you, that you take 35% chance seriously. But that's what we're talking about when we talk about genetics. There's a percentage chance of something affecting you, but it's not a guarantee. So sometimes, even when people are very, very confident about something, like when it comes to a nor'easter, or if it comes to a presidential election, we can all be very, very confident, but still be wrong. Sometimes there can be a very, very low percentage chance of something happening, and it still happens. We're caught out in a rainstorm without our umbrellas because we heard that there was only a 10% chance of rain. That's because when you run those models 10% of the time, it does rain. Something's very similarly true when it comes to genetic risk. So if you say that I have a 10% chance of developing dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, 10% of the time that does happen. Most of the time it doesn't. If you have a 35% chance of, the t of, of developing dementia, some people do and some people don't. It's hard to tell. So it's hard to talk about genetic risk for any one person because it is a balance of probabilities, just like the weather. So that said, one of the most interesting developments in the past year in Alzheimer's disease is something that's gonna sound very fancy when you tell your friends, which is called a polygenic risk score. And what that means is that we can kind of put together a lot of different genes into a profile. And based on that profile, we're not 100% sure about this yet, but based on that profile, we can predict not only whether you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, but when you're likely to start developing symptoms within about a one year period. So this is only good for research purposes right now. You can't go to your doctor and have this profile done. You might be able to in about five years, but we're not there yet. And 
The reason why we're not there is because we need more people to participate in research. Uh, and that's another reason why you should go see Lenore. Um, but right now we're, we're kind of moving into this era of being able to look at maybe 17 to 27 different genes. And if, we, if you have a certain profile of those genes, then it might be able to tell you whether and when you're gonna develop Alzheimer's disease. So the jury's still out, we're still trying to figure this out, but it does look to be very promising. Um, ultrasound and optics, this is a really, really cool uh, advances in Alzheimer's disease research. Um, so uh, you, are you guys familiar with ultrasound technology? Usually most people think about it if you're pregnant and you're looking for your baby and you wanna kind of know what the baby is looking like. Uh, you can use that same technology uh, to open up something called the blood-brain barrier. And uh, the blood-brain barrier is a barrier between your blood and your brain. That's, I mean, that's really it, guys. I'm sorry, there's, there's, no, there's no magic there. Um, it, the blood-brain barrier is exactly what it sounds like. So basically, uh, it's just a very complicated uh, biological barrier that keeps, um, you know, basically dirt and grime and germs in your blood from getting into your brain. And basically anything with a, with a neurological effect is something that's able to cross that blood-brain barrier. Um, so ultrasound can open that blood-brain barrier in such a way that it can either deliver medicine very precisely to get rid of uh, the amyloid and the tau in the brain, or it can open it up so that uh, lysosomes, which are in your blood stream all the time, can go in and clear out some of that gunk that we've been talking about. So what's nice is that the lysosome therapy is what we call non-pharmacological. You're not taking any drugs, you're just opening up that blood-brain barrier, and your body's natural healing defenses swarm into your brain, clear out the bad guys, and go back. So both of these technologies are very, very promising. And they've actually already started human clinical trials with uh, the, the ultrasound therapy, and, and this is over at uh, the University of Toronto. Uh, where actually it was this weekend. So um, at the University of Toronto, you can actually participate in human subjects research that is looking to try to clear uh, amyloid out of the brain using ultrasound technology. So what's great is that I think, Sarah, maybe one of the first times you heard about this talk, I was just talking about how this ultrasound therapy was done in rats, and now we're already doing it in people. So that's like a, a three-year turnaround, so really, really quick stuff. Um, the, additionally, there's also optical therapy where you can use light pulse treatments. Uh, if you shine a light in the eye at a very specific frequency, it has been shown to be able to break up amyloid plaques in, inside the brain along the optic track. So this is really new technology. It's great because, again, non-pharmacological. You're just blinking a light, like a light in your eye really, really fast. So don't go home and like hit your light switch really quick because it's, it's, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, but uh, the, 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 the hope is that we can use these non-pharmacological interventions to treat Alzheimer's disease. So what I, what I want you to know is that people are always asking, are we close to a cure for Alzheimer's disease? I would say the answer is no, but we are close to several cures for Alzheimer's disease. And so my guess is that the next decade will be an era in which we're trying to figure out the best treatment for you. So it's not that you'll have one option, it's that you'll have five or six, and you need to figure out which one works well. Um, sleep and Alzheimer's disease, this is a, a topic that's kind of, uh, comes in and out of the news cycle all the time. It was actually in the news cycle in the last week or two. Uh, because there was a, a new bullet point that I've added here about daytime sleepiness. But basically, the, the, the long and the short of it is, if you're having sleep problems as you get older, number one, that is a normal consequence of getting older. Uh, but number two, if you have uh, unusually disruptive um, sleep issues, then that could be indicative of that amyloid process starting to go crazy. So one thing that we have learned is that if you have good sleep hygiene, which means that you really try to sleep about the same time every night, you go to sleep and wake up around the same time, uh, and you try to stay asleep for most of that time, uh, then it engages something called the glymphatic system in your brain. And the glymphatic system basically goes in and clears a lot of gunk out of your brain. And one of the things that it's good at clearing out is amyloid, it can even clear out tau. Um, so changes in sleep patterns may affect your risk for Alzheimer's disease, and daytime sleepiness may indicate uh, the beginning of that buildup of amyloid. That doesn't mean that if you want a nap, 
that, that you're at risk of Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't mean that if you've listened to a random guy talk for 45 minutes and you're feeling a little sleepy, don't worry, that's not a warning sign. And that's actually working against my interest, so you know I'm telling the truth. So don't worry, uh, you're probably fine. But if this is a persistent problem and if it ramps up especially over about six months or a year, then you want to go and, and talk to your doctor about it. Okay, uh, and then the, one of the last couple of things I want to mention is the Mediterranean diet. Who's heard of the Mediterranean diet before? It's been in the news a lot. Uh, and what I like to do is I, I want to say that there have been dozens of studies looking at the Mediterranean diet and Alzheimer's disease specifically. And, you know, I'm not going to beat around the bush, guys. This is the real deal. The Mediterranean diet does work. It does cut your risk for Alzheimer's disease significantly. So there was a, the most famous study was done in 2015. They followed people for about four and a half years. Those who are really good at the Mediterranean diet cut their risk by 57%. Wow. In just a four and a half year period. So, the, so you can basically not be good at dieting at all start today, and you can significantly start cutting your risk of Alzheimer's disease. What's, best, what's better about that study is that they also followed people who were bad at the Mediterranean diet. And if you're bad at the Mediterranean diet, you still cut your risk by about 30% in a four and a half year period. So you can say, look, I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. You can still do a little bit to kind of affect you, to kind of reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease, okay? So there's always something that you can do, which is really great. Um, and then uh, the microbiome. Okay, so this is a little bit of a deep cut. I wanna know who's heard of the microbiome? Okay, so just a, a few hands. So the microbiome is, is basically a fancy term for all of the gut bacteria that you have. And it turns out that the bacteria that you have just in your gut are, affects your whole body, including your brain. And there's a, a lot of really promising research that suggests that getting the right balance, the right number of gut bacteria may affect not just your risk for Alzheimer's disease, but your risk for any kind of inflammation in your body and in your brain. So uh, any kind of chronic disease that you're trying to manage may be significantly affected by the diversity of, your, of the gut bacteria that you have. Uh, and so there are really uh, a couple of really, really world-class researchers um, through Mass General Hospital, Rudy Tanzi among them, uh, who is looking at, uh, looking at uh, the gut microbiome as a way of lowering your risk of Alzheimer's disease and also even treating uh, Alzheimer's disease in those who, who already have a diagnosis. So keep your eye on this space. Um, I have a feeling that if I were to give this talk in a year, this slide would probably be changing quite a lot with, with more uh, updated information. Um, so I want to sort of stress that there is currently no cure for Alzheimer's disease, uh, but there are ongoing clinical trials that are looking for uh, a cure. And a lot of those trials happen to be going on here in the greater Boston area. We have multiple sites where you can go for research opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of universities are looking at the cognitive effects of aging and Alzheimer's disease, but if you want to try a medicine, you can uh, obviously talk to Lenore. Um, uh, Boston University has an Alzheimer's disease center. I don't know if they're here today, um, but uh, you can also talk to them. Uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, all of these, these major centers, uh, some of which have outposts out here, um, are looking to try to test new cures for Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time, but uh, we are moving into the era of what I will call next generation treatments. So for those of you who are familiar with Aricept and Namenda as kind of as good as it gets with Alzheimer's disease, I want you to appreciate that there haven't been any new drugs approved for Alzheimer's disease uh, since 2004. So it's been, it's been 14, almost 15 years since we've had a new drug for Alzheimer's disease. So what we're working on now is very, very different uh, than, than those existing treatments are. Um, so the next generation treatments include um, you know, drugs that you can take, but also diet studies, vitamin studies, exercise studies. So if you don't want to take any medicine, you can still get involved in a clinical trial um, that is just good for you. You can do uh, a Mediterranean diet. Uh, exercise through Brigham and Women's Hospital, for example. Um, you can do exercise and vitamin studies through Boston University and, and talk about lowering your risk for Alzheimer's disease without having to, to pop a pill or worry about an infusion every month. Um, there is a, I, I wish I could have a little bit more time to talk about CRISPR, but for those of you who know what it is, uh, it is potentially a game changer in the world, uh, not just of Alzheimer's disease, but virtually all medical research. Um, if we can get CRISPR right, then we can eliminate um, pretty much any disease. Um, genetic or um, contagious. 
And that's not an exaggeration. Uh, so uh, I would encourage all of you to do some Googling at CRISPR. So it's C-R-I-S-P-R, -S it's, it's an acronym, so CRISPR. Um, combination drugs, anti-seizure medications, uh, younger and younger eligibility. When I first started giving this talk, you had to be 65 to enter some of these studies. Uh, but the news trials that are starting to enroll this year, you can be in your 50s. Um, so we're really looking at trying to move that window younger and younger for prevention therapies for Alzheimer's disease. Um, for those of you who are rolling your eyes and you want it even younger, it probably wouldn't do much good to have eligibility studies uh, in your 40s. So 50s is about as young as you probably need to be uh, to, to worry about some of this stuff. Um, Anti-aging, anti-inflammation studies are all on the docket for next generation therapies. Uh, there are hundreds of trials for Alzheimer's disease and there are gonna be hundreds more in just the next five years. So we really need people to, to get involved in considering research as an option because uh, the more people that are involved in research, the quicker we get to a cure. It's really, um, it's really just that factor that's holding us back. So, um, and, and it actually turns out that we don't need a lot of people to get involved, we just need a few. So if even 10% of the people in this room uh, were to consider uh, you know, advancing science through clinical research participation, uh, that's enough to actually move the needle, not just for us, but for, for people worldwide. So uh, it doesn't take a lot of time or a lot of effort, so I do encourage all of you guys to, to consider that. Um, if you're looking for help, uh, you know, not interested in research, but you wanna help, please consider the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, they are great uh, in a lot of different ways, information and support groups, uh, fundraising, volunteering, trial match, they have a number that you can call 24 hours a day. Um, whether you need a referral, if you need help, if you just wanna call and complain, <laughs> For 30 minutes, uh, they are absolutely there to listen. It's all free of charge. Uh, please definitely check them out. Local councils on aging and senior centers. Um, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because obviously uh, this is a place that you can go for information. Um, Alzheimer's research groups, Boston and Providence, uh, and uh, obviously uh, dementia friendly Massachusetts. I saw some people with dementia friends pins and dementia friendly pins uh, in the room. So please uh, check out those opportunities. Uh, the age-friendly movement, which is uh, being underwritten by the AARP, is also here, um, not just for dementia, but for all age-related uh, trends and tendencies. Uh, so there are resources uh, in this room, there are resources uh, through people in this room, and I would really encourage you to seek them out, because uh, if you're worried about aging, if you're worried about Alzheimer's disease, if you're worried about dementia, uh, there are people on the ground who are working on this, and there are some pretty good people uh, on the job. So. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I do have like another section on how to age gracefully, but I want to pause and just see if there are any questions uh, before we, we go on. Yes, ma'am. Is anything being done with metformin? Uh, the, question, the question is, uh, is anything being done with metformin? Uh, there are a couple of metformin studies um, that are also looking at consequences of dementia and thinking, uh, but none of them, I, as far as I can tell, are uh, looking at using metformin to prevent or treat Alzheimer's disease specifically. They are looking at improvements in memory and thinking uh, for, some, for some other diseases and disorders. So uh, obviously metformin is being used uh, a lot in diabetes, um, but it's also being used uh, in intolerance for celiac disease. Uh, and so these diseases also may have problems with memory and thinking as a consequence. Uh, and so metformin is being looked at in those capacities, but not necessarily to treat Alzheimer's disease in any kind of appreciable way. Okay, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, earlier yes. in your talk, you mentioned that Alzheimer's is climbing up the ladder on the yes. cause of death. I try to see the glass half full. Mm -hmm. Is that because the research is improving and that your advancements are improving as opposed to epidemic? So the question is, you know, is Alzheimer's disease really an epidemic or is it going up the list of the top 10 leading causes of death because we're getting better at recognizing it, we're getting better at detecting it. So that is certainly part of the answer. Uh, if you look at the trends in most developed countries, the overall uh, incidence of Alzheimer's disease versus prevalence, the overall incidence is that uh, it's going down in most developed countries. And so the reason why it's going down uh, in terms of the incidence, so that means you know, for every thousand people, this many get Alzheimer's disease. Um, that is going down because of advances in, in heart treatment and, and heart therapy. So if we're getting better at treating heart disease, we're also getting better at, uh, at sort of uh, potentially treating Alzheimer's disease. So the overall prevalence, the, that's just the total number of people, is going up mainly because of the aging of America. Uh, because the baby boomer generation is so large compared to the other generations in America, um, a larger number 
full stop of those individuals will probably come down with, with dementia and will die of it. So we are getting better at diagnosing it. We are getting better at recognizing it. The overall incidence is decreasing, but that total number is still going to be going up for some time. Uh, and, and that is in part because of the things that you recognize, but be, also in part because of uh, we're, we're the, the aging of America is an enormous uh, risk when it comes to, to Alzheimer's disease. Yes, ma'am. The question is, how long can I live when I have Alzheimer's? And you're waving because I think you know what I'm going to say. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. Uh, and it depends on some really interesting factors. So normally the disease course is that after the time of diagnosis, you can expect to live about 8 to 12 years. Um, but some people live much longer. Some people can live for two decades. Some people don't live for even a couple of years. Uh, and the reason why is uh, because of a couple of things. So number one is mixed dementias. So uh, very rarely do people just have Alzheimer's disease. They usually have some other kind of dementing disease as well, whether that's just depression, whether that is a, um, a dementia because of uh, vascular disease, whether it's a frontal temporal dementia that's also mixing and masquerading um, as, a, as, a, as kind of an Alzheimer's-like dementia. Those all play a role in, in how long you're likely to live. Another thing that plays a role is um, what we call brain reserve or cognitive reserve. And uh, one of the individuals who's affiliated with our, with our mass uh, Alzheimer's disease research center is, is kind of one of the world leaders in this effort, Doreen Rents. And what her research has shown is that uh, individuals with brain reserve, and this is a little bit tricky to follow, individuals with high brain reserve, so those, those are individuals who are kind of lucky <laughs> in terms of the opportunity they've had, so they, they are well educated, they, they have, they're well off socioeconomically. Um, those individuals tend to live for less time after the time of diagnosis. Uh, and, the, and that might sound surprising, but what, what's going on is that they are able to mask those symptoms for so long that by the time they're diagnosed, they are very, very advanced. And what you tend to find is that somebody who has uh, you know, a large number of years of education, uh, maybe they worked as a lawyer for 40 years, um, they will kind of be diagnosed and then they may sort of decline and die within like a two year span. And that's just because by the time they're diagnosed, they are really, really quite far advanced. So it really, it really depends on a whole host of factors. And I think we're getting closer to figuring out that particular calculus, uh, but we are, we're, there's, it's, we're not quite there yet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Excuse me, I, have, I can't see you that quick. Uh, I see there's some memory, uh, you're advertising memory medicine on TV. Oh. Um, so the question is that, so this gentleman has seen memory pills advertised on TV and they're available over the counter. Um, so the number one thing that I would say is that if you have a medicine that's just available over the counter, that usually means it's being sold as a supplement and not as a medicine. And so that the difference between those two things is that a supplement does not have to be evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. It means that they can say whatever they want and they do not have to have any proof um, to, to make their claims. So usually, if there is a supplement uh, that's being sold that is claims to improve your memory, and if they say anything along the lines of scientifically proven or clinically proven, it is probably, um, somewhat paradoxically, it's probably not true. What if it's a prescription drug? So there are some prescription drugs that can alleviate the symptoms of dementia. So Aricept and Namenda are the two biggest ones, and there are various remixes of those two. They are like taking cold medicine. They're not gonna cure your cold, but they will help you with your symptoms for a short amount of time, usually for about a year or two. Um, there are no known drugs or supplements that, uh, that can help your memory in any kind of long-term or permanent way. The best way to lower your risk of Alzheimer's disease at any age is to improve your diet. Because all the things that are going to be in these supplements and all the things that are going to be in these medications are really coming back to that same point. So leafy greens, lots of vegetables, cut down the red meat. You can have a little bit of white meat, um, you know, nuts, berries, some red wine. Sorry, white wine's not on the list. Um, uh, and some dark chocolate. Again, milk chocolate is not on the list. Get rid of the processed foods. Get rid of the sugar. The things that you know that you should be eating um, really, if you, if you need like a, a quick trick 
To lower your risk and to improve your memory, you've got to work on your diet. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Oh, boy. So the, the question was about brain games. Um, how long do we have? Uh, um, okay, so the, I'm going to make this really, really quick and, and very blunt, and I'm so sorry. Brain games don't work. They don't, they don't, they don't. Uh, because and there's, a, there's a lot, there's actually a shocking amount of literature that's been published over the last 25 years, and it all says the same thing, which is brain games don't do anything. Um, but uh, yeah, so it doesn't it doesn't work. Brain games don't work because they're they're fun and usually they 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 don't necessarily they don't harm you. They're not bad for you, but they are not good for you. So my advice about brain games is that if you can do it for free, go to town. But if you're paying money, you are much better off hanging out here at a senior center five days a week than you are playing a brain training game because a senior center gives you all of the things that you need. It gives you cognitive stimulation. Usually it's cheap or free. Uh, you might have to do a little bit of walking to get here. Um, you have a chance for social interaction. Those are the things that you need. Those are the things that you need to be doing. And usually it's much better to come to events like this than to sit playing Brain Age or um, Lumosity or anything like that. So those, those don't work nearly as well as hanging out here. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, who, who here's a regular exerciser? Oh, wow, lots of hands going up. So regular exercisers, you guys are doing it right. So keep that up. Try to get people to do what you're doing. You don't need to be doing CrossFit, but you do need to be getting regular exercise on a regular basis. So even if it's just walking, uh, it, it goes a long way. So just like with diet, exercise is what we call a dose-response effect. So um, if you're doing a little bit, that's great. If you can do a little bit more, that's even better. So even if you're completely sedentary, if you can get up and walk around your home just a couple of times a day, um, that, that works. It makes a difference. If you're already walking around your house a couple of times a day, if you can walk around your block a couple of times a day, that's going to make even more of a difference. But if you are truly like a regular exerciser and that's something that you've been doing for decades, um, then that is going to already uh, go a long way in, in decreasing your risk of dementia. Because what's good for the body and what's good for the heart is good for the brain. With yes, ma'am. Yes. So I, I would say that we are less confident about that. And just to repeat the, the woman's question and comment, which is uh, that it, it needs to be exercise that increases your heart rate rather than something that's like stretching or toning exercises. This is something that is being currently evaluated in a lot of clinical trials right now. So the common wisdom that we are testing, we're not sure. We think it has to be the kind of exercise that gets your heart rate up. And what's nice is that it doesn't have to get it up a lot, it just has to get it up for a while. Um, or conversely, you can do like the New York Times nine minute exercise routine, which gets your heart up really, really fast for just a few minutes. But that's a little bit harder to start doing from nothing. Um, so, right now we think you do need to get your heart rate up. You, it has to be a cardiovascular effect. Um, there is a tiny amount of research right now that suggests that stretching and toning can also help, but we're not sure under what circumstances. So I would say on the safe side, it probably needs to be cardiovascular exercise in particular. Um, but stretching and toning exercises, things like yoga, are also very, very good for stress. And stress is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Whether it's sustained stress across time, or acute stress, or a combination of the two, anything that you can do to, to cut the drama out of your life, I would highly recommend. Okay. Yes. Other, oh, sorry, I couldn't quite see you. Hi. Hi. So, thank you. It's, um, even though I'm quite young, you know, I'm always <laughs> thinking about it. Um, so other than dieting and exercising, yes. are there any other things that you can do to prevent um, dementia or Alzheimer's? 
Um, you know, we're quite busy. I multitask a lot. I go to school full time, um, almost full time. It feels like it. Um, I work full time. Right. I do so many things, and thank God I have a photographic memory that I attribute to sleeping. It is true. I sleep like nine hours a day. Okay. So. You know, but when I take vacations and I come back, it's like I can take over the world. My brain, <laughs> you know, I can absorb more. Right. So, and any other things that you can be doing, or is it true that having such a busy life and having so many things will actually, um, you know, accelerate Alzheimer's or dementia? No, I wouldn't say so. So I, I would say that diet and exercise, diet is the number one most important thing that you can do. And it's never too late to start. It's never too early to start. Exercise is number two. Um, in addition to that, I would say that you also need to make sure that you are sleeping adequately. So it's not just about sleeping a lot or sleeping not a lot. It's about good quality sleep. I used that phrase earlier about sleep hygiene. So try to go to sleep at the same time every day. Uh, for those of us who have smartphones, Try to leave the smartphone out of your bedroom. Do not pick it up during the night. Don't uh, you know? wake up a couple of times at night and check Instagram. You don't need to do that. Um, uh, in addition to sleep, I would say that stress is the, is the next thing. It's great to be busy. It's not great to be busy and extremely stressed. So if you, if you have a stressful job or if maybe you're a caregiver uh, or maybe you, you have a kind of a, a role that increases your stress quite a lot, make sure that you are taking time for yourself. Uh, and so that's not just one of those wishy-washy kumbaya things that it's like a good idea to do. This is, um, this is, what it, this is your health and your life on the line. So um, I would say that taking time to make sure that you're minimizing stress in your life, maybe getting rid of toxic and stressful people is a good idea. Um, so my, my first uh, paper that I wrote as a graduate student was about uh, individuals who had high stress in their lives and, uh, and how that affected their risk of Alzheimer's disease. So. Um, you know, try to make sure that uh, if you are busy in a way that you find productive, that it is not stressful, or if it has to be stressful, uh, try to make sure that you, you, you build in some time for yourself uh, to get away from that. So like you said, once you have a vacation and have a chance to kind of step away from everything, when you come back you feel very refreshed, try to do smaller moments of that. So think about yoga, think about mindfulness meditation. Uh, these things are, are more than just kind of catchy buzzwords, they, they do seem to work. Dr. Jeff, yes. um, what about genetics and families? Does it, can it, uh, Alzheimer's follow a line? A brother or sister has it, you have it, or parent has so, it, or uncle or aunt? So when it comes to genetic risk of Alzheimer's disease, 1.5% of all cases are what we call uh, familial Alzheimer's disease that follow along that genetic line. It is extremely rare, and uh, the odds are that if this was something that was in your family, you would know for one of two reasons. One a scientist would have probably contacted your family by now uh, because we're really good at tracking most of those families. And two, um, it would, it, Alzheimer's would completely be devastating to your family. So it would be at least half of all of your living relatives would have dementia. And it would be extremely aggressive early onset form. Uh, so that means that you would start to see symptoms uh, probably in your 40s um, you know, for, for most members of those, those families. So that's an extremely rare, extremely aggressive uh, version of Alzheimer's disease. Most of the rest of the cases are sporadic. And uh, fa family history, again, immediate family history, will increase your risk by about 50%. But if you have a 1% risk of Alzheimer's disease and you increase your risk by 50%, you're at 1.5%. So it doesn't necessarily mean, an uh, increase of 50% isn't necessarily major. Uh, it just, it might mean it's just sort of putting a, a kind of a thumb on the scale. So when it comes to genetic risk and Alzheimer's disease, I would say that um, family, family does matter, but um, it doesn't matter, I think, as much as some of the other things that we've been talking about today. Other questions, or otherwise, um, I will stick around until, you know, kind of answer questions kind of on a one-on-one on -on -one basis. But if that's it, um, thank you so much for your time and your attention. And I hope this was informative. Thank you so much.